Thank you. Whoa. Thank you, Pete. Whoa. Sorry, I need my drink. Jeez. All right. I'm incredibly nervous. I hope you still enjoy the talk. Uh, I ran through this with my wife last night, and I realized that talking to a person that doesn't understand anything about the technology you work on is super nerve-wracking. So I'm hoping the fact that you guys can connect some of these dots will, will relax me. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the ops that I'm doing over at Chaos Search and some of the, the ways that I've been jamming logs into S3. Uh, I'm hoping that it's entertaining. Uh, of course, we have Get to the Bucket, which is a takeoff from a, uh, oh, let's see if this will work. Get to the chopper. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> My slides are broken. Come on. How about up here? If I click up here? There we go. All right. So, get to the bucket. Uh, what I want to point out about this slide is that this is actually not the, the scene in the movie where he says, get to the bucket. This is the scene in the movie where Arnold says, get to the bucket. Or, sorry, get to the chopper. Uh, but for purposes of the meme, it does not work. Uh, we also have log like somebody's watching and store like you've never lost shards before. Which is a famous Benedict Cumberbatch uh, quote. It's a totally real quote. Uh, this came from my history running Elasticsearch at my previous companies, uh, which were the weather company, IBM, a company called Burst. Uh, now I'm over at, at Chaos Search. Every time I've had to run Elasticsearch, uh, I ran into lots of problems with nodes dying, losing shards. It was the bane of my existence. When Pete came and told me that he was working at Chaos Search and Chaos Search had figured out a way to rip the E out of the Elk stack, uh, I was very excited. I pleaded for a job. I am now the lead SRE here at Chaos Search, uh, which means that I'm an op, you idiot, which is my second Arnold Schwarzenegger reference. Hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> Chaos Search. So what we're doing is we are putting a Elasticsearch compatible API in front of S3. So store all your data on S3, index it from S3, full text searchable. It's great for your log, uh, your sort of long tail data issues where trying to uh, trying to search 50, 60 terabytes of web logs for a whole year would grind your ES cluster to a halt. Unless you talk to the lovely people at Logs.io, which I'm sure would give you a fantastic solution. Uh, the goals that we have are to drive down Elasticsearch costs, and right now we're in the drink your own champagne or eat your own dog food stage of, of the product. Uh, our op stack is based almost completely on the Chaos Search technology, so pretty much everything that we're doing from monitoring to alerting uh, to log processing all happens in the Chaos Search technology. All right. If it logs, we can search it, which is my third Arnold Schwarzenegger gift. <clears throat> so one of the things that happened when I came to uh, Chaos Search, I had been spending time at IBM and other gigantic corporations where operations is less about driving down costs or increasing the productivity of your developers, and it is much more about business continuity. What do you do if an engineer leaves? What do you do if a bunch of servers die? That was my main goal. And when I came to Chaos Search, which is a much smaller, uh, more agile organization where everybody is sort of an adept coder, I had to shift my primary goal towards reducing costs. If the whole purpose of your product is to make Elasticsearch cheaper and easier to run, you aren't spending a ton of time with your Chef servers. You can do a lot of that, the work that you would normally do with something like Chef in like a user service script or user data when something launches. So for me, it was an emotional sort of sort of role. You you understand all this stuff about Chef or Salt or whatever. You go to a company that has very little interest in sort of working on that business continuity tooling, and a lot more on just focusing on on running things as cheaply and efficiently as possible, which will let us drive down the cost for customers, uh, which hurt me emotionally a significant amount. This is different on at every organization. Every organization will have a different sort of. Uh, calculus when they think about cost versus business continuity versus uh, making developers faster. For us right now, uh, getting that price point as low as possible for storing things in ES is, is really what we're, what we're working towards. Which uh, brings us to our monitoring system, which right now is mostly lambdas. We're doing lambdas for days. 
So, lambdas are incredibly cheap. Everybody knows that lambdas are incredibly cheap. My thought was, if we were to keep our monitoring scripts down to a 10 second runtime and run them every minute for the 730 hours of the month, it would be about 92 cents per monitoring point that we created. Which is pretty cheap. Uh, 10 checks would then be you know, 10 bucks, 100 checks would be 100 bucks. Uh, if we could reduce our, our execution time to three seconds, 100 checks would be 30 bucks a month. 30 bucks a month actually kind of comes down to around 20 bucks a month when you factor in the free tier that you get from, uh, from AWS just for using Lambda, which is fantastic. Uh, so we have a lot of these monitoring Lambdas that are written in Python. They take a couple seconds to run. They fire off to an SNS queue to kind of alert people when there's issues. And they write their status to S3. So we end up with this monitoring system that's sort of this stateless, uh, you know, scalable, wide uh, service, which is fantastic. Uh, and it gives me more data in S3 to index in chaos search and do pretty visualizations. If I compare that to a single T3 large, it would be around 60 bucks a month. Uh, if I were to reserve that T3 large, it would be 38 bucks a month. Then I'd need two of them. I'd have to have something like Chef configuring them. I'd have to figure out the redundancy story. And I'd have to have monitoring for my monitoring service. So, uh, we ended up with a lot of lambdas, which is fantastic. In my opinion, I realize that should be a joke to other people. <clears throat> so uh, we end up with these little status payloads that are all over S3. Uh, they look a lot like a Nagios uh, status, where they have a state and a last change count, and some data that you can then graph. And then here's me visualizing one. This is wonderful, it's all sanitized, so that we don't, we're not GA yet, so I can't cheer you the customers. But, uh, this is an actual visualization that I look at from time to time on back to views. I'm going to get a drink. <laughs> I'm nervous, I'm sorry. Okay, so when I first started a chaos search, the developers had been doing a lot of development on their own laptops, which meant they were used to uh, running applications on their laptops, which meant when we had things close to production, logs were still getting created inside of containers. They weren't just getting written to standard app. Containers, uh, if you make changes to the file system, end up in the overlay to file system, which is exposed on the host. So the first sort of ghetto log pusher that we have uh, would go through the overlay to file system, it would find logs that we thought were interesting after they'd been rotated, and it would periodically push them up to S3. So while this sounds sort of terrible and gross, it worked incredibly well, to the point where the developers really liked this, but I agree that it's like pretty icky. Uh, but it does, it does work. So if you're stuck in the boat where you can't get the logs out of the containers, uh, kind of violating, uh, violating the layers and going directly through the file system works fairly well. Again, this one <laughs> seemed correct. <clears throat> All right. So after I did this horrible thing with Python to ship logs, which does work fantastically well, uh, I wanted to go into the libbeat project, which is wonderfully, uh, wonderfully poorly documented from the outside, but the code is actually like pretty good inside. It's all written in Go. It's the library that is the foundation for libbeat, packetbeat, filebeat, a whole host of other beats. The whole point of libbeat is to take data, turn it into a JSON object, and put it somewhere. Uh, the places that it gets put are like different outputs. So there's a Kafka output, there's a TCP output, there's a logstash output, which is really just a TCP output. Uh, but one of the outputs that exists is this file output. File output will, will take all the log data that it pulls out of various logs, jam them into another file. If you dig into libb, you can find that the file outputs has this file rotation, where if you have the output gets to a certain size, it will either rotate the logs out or if they get too old. So we put together a patch set, which is about 150 lines, that hijacks where the rotation happens, and then uploads those files up into S3, which again, Chaos Search will then pop off, index, we can visualize. It's lovely, it works great for file beat, it works great for metric beat, I haven't tried the other beats, uh, it would be nice if it didn't write the file twice. 
uh, as in the file getting written to the file system or to the Docker log, uh, and then picked up, written to the file being output, and then shipped. But I haven't gotten that far yet. Uh, there was a guy named Fritz Hardy who has a PR for a very similar functionality. And uh, according to the Elasticsearch people, unfortunately, we do not currently plan to further add outputs as each output adds additional work and maintenance on the support side. So that's never going to get imported into file B, which is a shame. Uh, but it's been helpful for us. We're hoping to make it open source. So one of the upsides of using file B or any of the lib beats is you can add metadata as log lines get pulled off the file system. However, there is 113 lines of metadata in this object that was pulled off the file system. If you look over in bold, we have checking the Elasticsearch version. So this is a, a log line that I believe came out of Kibana. And every time you want to ship any log, if you wanted to pull a line off the file system and add 118, sorry, 113 extra lines, you would think it was crazy, but it's sort of the pattern that we use in all Elasticsearch stuff right now. It's something that I'd like to see tweaked, something I'd like to see fixed. I would totally love it if Elasticsearch had joins. It does not. Uh, so for now, we're in this world where we pull a line off the file system, make it way fatter than it was before, and then ship it, which is super inefficient. Uh, which brings us to CloudWatch logs. Give me one more second. It's supposed to be slowing down. I was getting teased mercilessly by the salespeople today about being nervous, and they were right. <laughs> <laughs> CloudWatch logs. So we have these lambdas that are a monitoring system, which are fantastic. Uh, however, they tend to log into CloudWatch logs, which, if you haven't interacted with it, is one of the worst features that AWS has. It's super great that it captures all the output of your lambdas. That is fantastic. However, the visualizations that it gives you and the searching functionality it gives you is next to nothing. But what I found was you can export these logs relatively easily. So I have an example here of taking uh, the last hour of logs from AWS Lambda SQS length alerting, which is, again, part of the monitoring system, and shipping it to my bucket, which that's not my real bucket. But this is a, a reasonable facsimile of of a, a thing you could either put in a cron job or run from your laptop that would ship your logs from CloudWatch into S3. Uh, a little tip, if you are using lambdas and you are doing something like this where you want to pull the log down later and grep on it or search on it, it's great if you could include the request ID for your lambda in logging output, every line that comes out of it, so that you can easily sort of find the execution at a later date. Uh, other tools you could use for this would be like CloudWatch Beat, which I think was done by like Travelocity or something, or Logstash Input CloudWatch Logs, which is a plugin for Logstash that somebody wrote, or you could hack together some other stuff with Kinesis and Lambdas, which is cool and useful, but heavier weight than I wanted to do. So, let's see. This is what a CloudWatch log would look like. It's gross. It is super, super gross. Uh, it's, this is kind of a lie because when you export the logs, you actually get the full date. You don't just get the hours. But uh, trying to follow the execution of a Lambda through this is tricky. Uh, I did, I'd actually asked Tom McLaughlin, who's the, uh, I believe, the guru of serverless ops in Boston. Uh, <laughs> I was like, what is the appropriate way to log my Lambdas in a sane way? And he gave me like a bunch of links to these cool libraries that I had no interest in learning. So <laughs> instead, uh, we include the request ID at the beginning of each log line in the logger in the Python file, and then uh, we export the CloudWatch logs into S3 and index them. Uh, so <laughs> there's another predator one. This is my like, I, it's supposed to be you ugly something, but. This is how I feel about the CloudWatch logs. I feel like they're uh, pretty gross, and uh, they could be so much better, but uh, it doesn't seem like AWS puts a ton of time into it. And then this is me using Kibana to find an error. If you ever use Kibana, not a very interesting slide. Uh, all right, so my last little bit is my super expensive mistake, because when I was pulling these slides together, uh, I was told by somebody that uh, this would sort of be the highlight of the whole thing. So, what I learned 
when I was playing with uh, pushing log in the S3 is that lists are incredibly expensive in S3. They are literally 10 times as much as a get. So if you are not sure if an object exists in S3 anymore or was pushed there before, don't do a list. Just try to get the object. Catch it when it uh, fails and then just kind of move on and say, okay, that file doesn't exist in S3, I'm gonna push it up there. I did not know this. Uh, and I released a bug to try, or sorry, I released a fix to try to make our shipper more reliable. Uh, and in the process, uh, it was checking every single file that a container had pushed out uh, that was rotating every minute. And I left this stuff running for a few days. Which meant over, over four or five days, we had billions and billions of requests uh, of lists to S3. Uh, AWS will not stop you from consuming their service. They're, <laughs> they're incredibly happy to allow you to, uh, you know, make a billion list operations on a, on a bucket with, you know, a million objects in it. So what we have here is this, uh, Cheslock <laughs> pointed out that this was the right gift. <laughs> so it's here. Uh, so this is my sucking up to my boss slide. Uh, if you look on the left, you will see these bars. Each one of these bars represents like a good car payment or a small mortgage payment. Uh, and then if you look to the right over here, these represent like cups of coffee. Uh, and so that was that was a bad thing. Uh, this reminded me. Uh, I always have complained about bosses that nickel and dimed me or called me up and said, you know, you've got this test environment, you need to shut it down, you're going away for two days. I thought they were being ridiculous. I'm a highly paid engineer. I should have all the tools at my discretion at all times. But uh, if you're smart with your money and if you're good at like shutting down your environments and you're saving 10, 15, 20, 30 dollars here, uh, when you do have a mistake of this magnitude, it's a lot easier to sort of recover from and not have your budget for the quarter long. So next time somebody tells you to turn things off or try to save money, uh, you know, take it to heart. I made this GIF. I had no place in the slide deck to put it, so it's here. Who is your log source and what does it do? This is from Kindergarten Cop. Uh, so that's two Kindergarten Cop Arnold slides. Uh, and again, scene correct image from the movie, which if you're going to do a mem, you need to do that. Uh, all right, so in summary, uh, maybe the WTF and what did you build, sorry, the WTF and WTF did you build is what? Maybe it's not so much about doing the same thing because it worked for you at your last position, your last job. It's re-examining why you did it and what you're actually trying to get done from day to day. Uh, I would personally love it if somebody would make a monitoring stack based on lambdas. I think they're reasonably cheap. If you have a development team that's thick with development and everybody can code, why not do it in lambdas? Uh, you can do terrible, dirty things with the overlay file system, get lots of data pushed to S3. Turned out to be surprisingly reliable, which is why you know uh, it's good to test these sort of things. Uh, poking up the, li the libb uh, code base was surprisingly easy. Cloudwatch logs are incredibly ugly. If you leave here with only one thought, I want you to remember that Cloudwatch logs are ugly, and Patrick Flaherty has a fantastic class. I am the lead SRE at Chaos Search. I'm at Platform Patrick on Twitter. I run a conference up in Lowell that's gonna be in a couple of months called Keep It Lowcom. It's a single track DevOps conference in a really comfy theater. Uh, and if you wanna talk about storing data in S3, indexing it for cheap, and making it easy to search. We are chaossearch.io. Uh, talk to me or Pete. I think that's it. Up next is Pat Cable. I'm almost relaxed. Oh, crap. Up next is Pete. All right, let's give it up.